Consider now Enceladus, Saturn's icy moon, one of the most promising places to look for life outside Earth. Scientists have just detected the last one of the six necessary ingredients for its formation, phosphorus. This rarest element has been discovered in an ocean on Enceladus. This rare element helps make the soil fertile on Earth. But the concentration of this mineral in the hidden seas on the distant moon might be from 100 to 1,000 times greater than in the oceans of our home planet. It might be because Enceladus' ocean is rich in carbonates, just like soda water, and this soda water is likely to dissolve the phosphates in the moon's rocks. The new discovery also suggests that on other icy moons of Saturn, like Titan, the waters may be loaded with phosphorus too. Why are scientists so excited about this mineral? Well, phosphates, which are compounds that contain phosphorus, are crucial components of life on Earth. DNA, RNA, and cell membranes contain them. But among those six elements required for life, which are carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur, phosphorus is the least common. In 2004, the Cassini space probe entered the dust from the second outermost ring of Saturn, called the E-ring. It's made up of ice grains and Cetalus ejects. And while studying these ice grains examined by Cassini's cosmic dust analyzer, researchers have detected phosphorus. Enceladus is the sixth largest moon of Saturn. It's not really large, only 314 miles across. This makes the space body small enough to fit inside Arizona. Hmm, we should try that sometime. Interestingly, when the Cassini space probe first arrived at Saturn, astronomers thought that Enceladus was going to be a frozen ball of ice. But then, surprise, surprise, they spotted plumes of icy particles and water vapor erupting from geysers on the moon's surface. It became clear that there was a global ocean between the moon's rocky core and its icy shell. The same researchers previously discovered that Saturn's moon might be home to complex organic molecules, too. Before, scientists thought phosphates could be trapped within the rocky cores of Enceladus and similar worlds. That's why the newest works, which hint that phosphates might also be abundant in the ocean, came as a surprise. Researchers examined 305 ice grains from Saturn's E-ring and found out that 9 of them contained phosphates. And these results were clear and unmistakable. And it's very important because some time ago, phosphine, a compound of hydrogen and phosphorus, was believed to exist in the clouds of Venus. But no one has managed to find any evidence to support this theory. On Enceladus, there's no controversy, and phosphates do exist there. Astronomers consider Europa one of the most promising places in the solar system to search for new life forms. All because this moon has a huge saltwater ocean with a depth of 40 to 100 miles. Yes, it is hidden under a layer of ice that is estimated to be from 10 to 20 miles thick. But it is still potentially habitable. Astronomers claim that plumes of water erupt from cracks in the ice shell and release the contents of the moon's ocean into space. Of course, it's going to be challenging for any life-seeking mission to access such a deep environment. On the bright side, as we are, scientists already have some evidence that there are way shallower pools that probably lie much closer to the surface of the moon. They might be located even less than one mile under the ice. And there are two great things about this news. First of all, it boosts the odds of life existing on Europa. And secondly, if it's true, it can make it easier for future missions to find these life forms, if there are any. Then we've got Titan, Saturn's largest moon. It's smaller and has lighter gravity than Earth, but it still reminds us of our planet. Like on Earth, nitrogen dominates its atmosphere. Titan is the only other world in our solar system with lakes and rivers. These water bodies are made of hydrocarbons, methane, and ethane. There's also a subsurface ocean of water, but it's located very deep down, and no one has figured out yet if this ocean makes contact with anything under the surface. If it does, it could provide fuel for life after mixing with complex chemistry on the surface. But Enceladus and the other icy moons aren't the only place in the solar system that might host or once hosted life. In 2003, Mars Express, 
a spacecraft launched by the European Space Agency, discovered methane in the atmosphere of Mars. On our planet, the biggest part of this gas in the atmosphere is produced by living creatures, for example, by cattle digesting food and emitting, you know, gas. However, scientists think that methane was stable in the Martian atmosphere for about 300 years. And then, in 2006, the methane almost entirely vanished from the red planet. And it happened 600 times faster than the researchers' model accounted for. The question? What or who generated the gas, and where did it go? Another Martian mystery is microbes that might be sleeping beneath the surface of Mars. There, they might have been protected from the harsh radiation coming from space for millions of years. Scientists simulated the conditions on Mars in a lab to check if it could possibly be true. And they were amazed to find out that bacteria could easily survive in such conditions for 280 million years. Ooh, that's a long shelf life! This means that if life existed on Mars, we could find the evidence in the planet's subsurface by drilling into the Martian soil. Right now, there is no flowing water on Mars, and cells or spores would simply dry out. Plus, the frozen temperature is similar to that of dry ice. In other words, it's deeply frozen. Let it go. And still, there could be six types of bacteria and fungi living underground on the red planet. The most likely of them is nicknamed Conan the Bacterium due to its tough nature. Well, I guess time will show. Anyway, if we don't find life outside Earth in our solar system, we could probably look for it on exoplanets, which is what planets outside our star system are called. Some of them look very promising. The closest to Earth exoplanet is Proxima Centauri b. It's a mere 4.2 light-years away from Earth. Recently, astronomers have found out that this world might resemble Earth even more than they previously thought. It's just 17% more massive than our home planet. It orbits a star that is dimmer and less massive than the Sun. Proxima Centauri b is in the middle of the star's habitable zone. This means that the chances of liquid water and life might exist on the planet. It looks like the exoplanet is tidally locked with its parent star. One of its sides faces the star at all times, and the other is always in the darkness. Scientists haven't figured out yet whether the planet has an atmosphere. It's traveling too close to its star and completes one orbit within 11 Earth days. The radiation from the star might be pulling the planet's air away. If this is the case, Proxima Centauri b isn't likely to have liquid water on its surface. Gliese 832c is 16.2 light-years away from Earth. In the cosmic scheme of things, it's a stone's throw away. This exoplanet is five times as massive as Earth and travels much closer to its parent star. That's why a year on this planet lasts a mere 36 days. But since this star is a red dwarf, much cooler and dimmer than the Sun, Gliese 832c gets as much light and heat as our planet. At the same time, it's still unclear if it's similar to Earth. The planet probably has a much thicker atmosphere that creates a runaway greenhouse effect. This phenomenon occurs when a planet absorbs more heat from its host star than it can release back into space. This means that Gliese 832c is more likely to resemble scorching hot Venus rather than the relatively cool Earth. Hey, I'm cool with that. Do you recognize this majestic world? The second largest planet from the Sun? Check. A gas giant with a hazy yellow-brown appearance? Check. Seven huge, intimidating rings? Check. You're right, it can't be anything else but Saturn. And recently, the Hubble Space Telescope has made an astonishing discovery. Apparently, the planet's rings have been doing something to the planet for a long time. A new study has revealed that these iconic rings are heating Saturn's upper atmosphere. The coolest thing, though, is that researchers from NASA claim that it's something scientists have never observed anywhere else in our solar system. This secret has been hiding in plain view for 40 years. And only after using the observations of the planet received from the Hubble Space Telescope and retired Cassini probe and Voyager 1 and 2 spacecraft did astronomers figure it out. 
This unexpected interaction of the gas giant with its rings could become a tool for predicting if planets in other star systems have magnificent Saturn-like ring systems as well. So, how did it become clear that the gas planet is being slowly cooked by its own rings? The telltale evidence is an excess amount of ultraviolet radiation. It can be seen as a spectral line of hot hydrogen in the atmosphere of the gas giant. There's a bump in radiation that can only mean that something is heating the upper atmosphere from the outside. It's still kind of unclear how this process is happening, but the most probable explanation is that icy ring particles rain down on Saturn and cause this heating. But it might also be the impact of tiny meteorites or the particles of solar wind. The heating could be caused by solar ultraviolet radiation or some electromagnetic forces that pick up electrically charged dust. When NASA's Cassini probe finished its mission and plunged into Saturn's atmosphere, it had enough time to measure the atmospheric components. And it turned out that many particles were indeed falling from its rings. But in any case, the heating process happens under the influence of the gravitational field of the gas giant. You see, astronomers do know about the slow disintegration of Saturn's rings, but figuring out how this process affects the planet? That's new. Now, do you remember NASA's Cassini spacecraft I mentioned before? For more than a decade, it was studying Saturn, sharing images of the gas giant and its icy moons. It took us to marvelous worlds where methane rivers ran into methane seas and jets of gas and ice were blasting material into space. Anyway, that very Cassini also studied Saturn's magnetosphere. The thing is, forces acting deep inside the planet produce a ginormous magnetic bubble under the planet. And this bubble is called the magnetosphere. Unfortunately, astronomers still have very little information about this phenomenon on Saturn, since magnetic fields are invisible and are, of course, best studied from within. Imagine this. Million mile per hour flows of electrically charged particles from the Sun, aka solar wind, are spreading through the solar system. Suddenly, something appears in their way. Oh, it's Saturn's magnetic field! It protects the planet, making solar particles back away. As a result, the Sun's magnetic forces are raging outside Saturn's magnetosphere, while inside the gas giant's protective bubble, its own magnetic forces dominate. Our home planet also has a magnetic field, but it creates a much smaller magnetosphere. And still, it effectively protects us from the harmful particles coming from the Sun and from space. But even though Saturn is protected by its magnetosphere, the Sun still manages to mess with the planet. Energetic winds from our star sweep over the gas giant, causing massive auroras. But unlike auroras here, on Earth, Saturn's auroras can only be seen in ultraviolet light. In other words, they're invisible from Earth's surface. You can only see them if you travel to space. But apparently, there are different kinds of auroras on the gas giant. For example, one more type is triggered by the charged particles coming from volcanic eruptions on the planet's moons. And some of Saturn's auroras might be caused by powerful winds swirling in the planet's own atmosphere. These winds blow in the ionosphere, which is a region located beneath the magnetosphere. The same winds might be responsible for the variable rotation rate of the planet. This phenomenon makes it difficult for scientists to figure out how long one day on the ringed planet lasts. Speaking of winds, Saturn has a mysterious vortex swirling over the planet's south pole. The whole thing resembles an enormous hurricane-like storm on Earth, but its eye alone measures almost 2,500 miles across. For comparison, the eye of a typical terrestrial hurricane is a mere 2 to 3 miles wide. What confuses astronomers is that although the phenomenon looks like a hurricane, it doesn't behave like one. It's stationary and keeps spinning over the same area of the South Pole. And while polar vortices on Earth have cold cores, the one on Saturn is warm. And now, brace yourself for another surprise Saturn has prepared for us. 
In an image sent to Earth by the Hubble Space Telescope, one can notice a couple of dark, shadowy spots on the left side of the planet's rings. Those are informally called spokes, maybe because they resemble spokes on a bicycle. The shading and shape of spokes vary. They may seem dark or light. It depends on the angle and illumination. Sometimes they may even look like blobs rather than something with a classical radial spoke shape. They also don't last long. But the good news is more and more will start to appear the closer we are to May 6, 2025. That's when the autumnal equinox on Saturn will occur. Now on Earth, that's the moment when the Sun is exactly above the equator of the planet and day and night are of the same length. But on Earth, it's something a bit different. Like our planet, Saturn is tilted on its axis. That's why it has four seasons. But since the orbit of the gas giant is much larger, each of these seasons lasts about seven Earth years. An equinox occurs when Saturn's rings are tilted edge on to the Sun. But what causes the spokes? Astronomers think it might be the gas giant's magnetic field. When a planetary magnetic field interacts with the solar wind, it creates an electrically charged environment. As we already know, on Earth, this results in northern lights, also called aurora borealis. And if we speak about Saturn, the tiniest icy ring particles might get charged too. And it probably temporarily levitates these particles above the larger boulders in the rings. For the first time, the spokes in Saturn's rings were spotted by NASA's Voyager mission. It happened in the early 1980s. At that time, we didn't know that these spokes were a seasonal phenomenon. Voyager 2 just passed by the planet, after all, and then sped on. To figure out what these spokes were and how they functioned, astronomers needed a space telescope that could observe Saturn's rings from afar, like Hubble. The latest equinox on Saturn occurred in 2009. That's when the Cassini space probe was traveling around the gas giant. It sent many amazing images back to Earth. It managed to prove quite quickly that the spokes weren't caused by gravitational interactions with Saturn or the influence of the gas giant's moons or small moonlets, which make up the planet's rings. It was the year 2005 when Cassini confirmed that the spokes were related to Saturn's magnetic field. And even though that mission was finished in 2017, now Hubble keeps its long-term monitoring of the changes on and around Saturn. Despite all the observations, astronomers still can't predict the beginning and duration of the spoke season. Luckily, Saturn's prominent rings are a perfect laboratory for studying this phenomenon. Because even though other gas giants in the solar system also have rings, those are not so visible. And scientists don't know whether spokes occur on those planets. Look up. Find that little yellow dot. That's Titan. It's Saturn's largest moon and the second largest moon in our whole solar system. And it might be the only place in our solar system where there's liquid water, besides Earth. Plus, it has an atmosphere that serves as a shield against solar radiation and cosmic rays, just like Earth. If life was a house, Titan would have a lot of the bricks you'd need to build it. Strap in, you're heading over there. It takes a long time to get to Titan, but you know, the magic of YouTube. Here it is, a bit bigger than our moon and a whole lot heavier. It's even bigger than Mercury. That means its gravity is still pretty weak. You'll feel seven times lighter here than on Earth. At the local gym back home, you can lift 150 pounds. On Titan, you can lift more than 1,000. Ha, looking good. The surface is mostly made up of ice. It has small mountains, craters, and a few cryovolcanoes. Basically, the same as a regular volcano. But instead of lava, this beast spits out water, ice, ammonia, and methane. There are lakes and clouds, kind of like a canyon would look like on Earth. But here, there's only a tiny difference. Everything is covered in thick fog, and sometimes it hails frozen methane. On Earth, we use methane as fuel because it burns. But on Titan, there's no oxygen. Can't get a fire going on this hunk of rock. No oxygen means you need to put on an oxygen mask, but you don't have to wear a whole spacesuit like on our moon. Titan has a stronger atmosphere, but you packed a sweatshirt, right? 
It's going to get pretty cold soon, like negative 300 degrees cold. The coldest it ever got on Earth was negative 128, and that was right at the South Pole. It's so cold because it's so far from the sun, almost 900 million miles. Anyway, that dense fog and atmosphere stopped the sun's rays from warming the surface. Sounds kind of extreme, but so is life. It can survive almost anywhere. Take the bacteria, de no, some long Latin word. It can survive radiation and extremely low temperatures. It even survived a whole year in outer space on the outside of the International Space Station. Titan would be a piece of cake compared to that, especially if we drilled down a bit. Many scientists believe there's a whole ocean under the surface of Titan. Saturn's gravity gives Titan's core a little heat boost. Plus, there's ammonia in that ocean. It's like Titan's version of antifreeze. As long as the water stays liquid, life's got a pretty strong chance of success. So what's down there? Scientists have actually found real evidence that Titan might already have life on it. Here, check out this microscope. This is C3H2. It was discovered by this weird group of antenna things living in the desert in Chile. It used 66 antennas, all pointed at the same place in the sky. This C3H2 molecule can act as a building block for DNA, the code of life. Some people think that these molecules were around on our planet billions of years ago, just when life began. Scientists also checked it out firsthand with a probe that actually landed on Titan. Turns out those desert antenna things were right. Titan shot to the top of the list of places we could one day live on. Sorry, Mars. NASA has a new project, the Dragonfly mission. They're going to send a drone out there and explore Titan even more. The mission's still about six years away, and the rocket will reach Saturn's moon nine years after that. So we're going to have to wait a while before we pack up and move to Titan. After the Dragonfly drone lands on Titan's surface, it's going to whiz around like a sort of double helicopter. It's going to have eight propellers, three feet wide. Since there's weak gravity, that's more than enough to give the drone good cruising speed. It'll be able to fly about two miles straight up and take off and land vertically, like a regular helicopter. The main problem with the whole thing is the drone's batteries. Scientists invented a generator that converts thermal radiation energy into electrical energy, whatever that means. One battery charge should be enough for several hours of continuous flight. The Dragonfly is going to be carrying a lot of research equipment, so it's not like those drones people fly in the park on a Sunday. It's going to weigh about as much as three ostriches. It's going to have two drills, a bunch of sensors, a spectro thing to find out what chemicals are lying around, and it's also going to have its own weather channel with a ton of instruments to measure temperature and clouds and stuff. And like any gadget nowadays, it has a camera on it. Get ready for some beautiful pics of Titan's epic landscape. Nighttime on Titan lasts about eight Earth days. That's when the drone's going to be relaxing on the surface, recharging and analyzing samples. That's a long time, but it's actually a good thing. Titan's distance from Earth causes a bit of a problem, a delay in communication. When they send the Dragonfly a signal from Mission Control, it has to fly halfway across the solar system. <laughs> it takes over an hour. In contrast, the signal delay to Mars can be as little as 10 minutes, and the signal delay to the Moon is only about a second. Scientists expect Dragonfly to provide more information about whether we can live on Titan or not. Some experts hope to find a primordial soup there. It's a whole mush of stuff needed to make life. We had that same soup on Earth about 4 billion years ago, and every single living organism that ever existed evolved from this mush of organic elements. If the Dragonfly project's a slam dunk, and Titan does turn out to be habitable, it'll have one more mission, to find a nice place for us to settle down in. But creating a self-sustaining colony on another planet would definitely be the hardest thing humans have ever done. First hurdle, energy production. Probably some sort of nuclear power plant. Then comes shelter, for humans and their machines. Those new Titan buildings will have to protect us from the extreme cold and bad weather. Then, 
drinking water and oxygen. We'd need to invent a way of collecting or engineering both. Then, greenhouses for growing food. We'd also need to mine fuel for transportation. Luckily, Titan's packed full of methane, which is great for fuel. One huge problem, gravity. Because it's so weak on Titan, whoever lives there could lose a lot of muscle mass, making it hard to work and even just live. And there are those pesky cryovolcanoes shooting stuff out at random times. Or maybe we'd need a more drastic, daring idea. How about changing Titan's atmosphere so we can breathe on it and not have to wear about a hundred hats and gloves? To do this, we'd need to terraform Titan's surface for a long time. Titan's atmosphere needs to be enriched with oxygen for us to breathe, and it would be great if it was a bit warmer. The next step is to create a biosphere, which means plants. We could turn Titan into a blooming jungle with plants brought over from Earth. But because of pressure and gravity, they'd look completely different from Earth plants. They might all grow super tall, or maybe they'd all shrink down to mini size. We really don't know. First things first, we need to make sure that life is even possible on Titan. Scientists recently thought there might be life on Venus. It's sort of the same size as Earth, and scientists even call it Earth's twin sister. They discovered a gas on Venus, phosphine. Supposedly, it was made by living organisms. Turns out it wasn't true. Well, not really. There is some phosphine floating around, but way less than we first thought. Look, science on other planets is super hard, people. We're always making mistakes like that. 